Um, and last but not least, um, unfortunately, Adam isn't able to present today. Um, he's, he's had a family matter come up. So we've got Sarah Rahman. Good morning. Oh, thanks for being here. Um, yes, the bad news is that I'm not Adam. Uh, but the good news is that I am Sarah, the co-author of this paper. So in some hand, I'm not just some random. Uh, so hopefully I can do a good job. Um, before I proceed, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Our Nation on whose lands we meet today and their elders past, present, uh, and emerging, and any Aboriginal colleagues in the room. Um, so we're all aware of the, the serious problem of Aboriginal representation in New South Wales. There's no way that I could do it uh, the same justice and uh, deliver this message with more impact and clarity than our uh, awesome Aboriginal leaders that you saw earlier today. Um, and here are some statistics on the screen that are pretty easy to read. But policymakers for some time have been trying to reduce overrepresentation in, in various ways, but progress towards you know, closing the gap targets, for example, remains fairly slow. Um, policing can certainly contribute towards overrepresentation if police are being unfairly severe towards Aboriginal people. Um, and one police decision where it's been suggested that that might be the case is cannabis cautioning. And this is the focus of our study. <laughs> So before I go any further, I'll just provide some background into the cannabis questioning scheme in New South Wales. Uh, it originated from the 1994 Drug Summit, which recommended the creation of a formal diversion pathway for low-level cannabis offenders. Um, it's one of a few drug diversion programs available in New South Wales, in addition to the Drug Court uh, and Merit, which Don Weatherburn spoke about yesterday. Um, it allows the police to issue a caution rather than formally charge uh, used possessed cannabis offenders. Um, how it works is that if someone is caught in possession of uh, cannabis, police secure the, the drugs, assess whether they're eligible for the scheme, and decide whether they want to issue the person a caution. If they do decide to issue someone a caution, a person uh, and the person consents, they receive a caution notice, um, which provides them information about the harms of cannabis use uh, and refers them to a uh, call an alcohol and drug uh, information service, which is basically a hotline. They can call the service, uh, they can choose whether or not to call the service, but my understanding is they, they, sh they must if they're on their second question, but we're not really sure how often this happens in practice. Um, <clears throat> in 2020, um, an article from The Guardian used our data in Boxer um, between 2013 and 2017 on uh, cannabis use possessed uh, incidents, and high, well, they did some descriptive analysis of the rates of cannabis questioning among Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. Uh, their analysis showed that there was quite a significant gap of about 30 percentage points uh, in the likelihood of receipt of a, crim uh, of a cannabis caution between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. Uh, this is somewhat concerning because past literature suggests that cannabis cautioning can have some benefits to people like uh, reducing their further offending. Uh, it might uh, increase the likelihood of them remaining in employment. Um, but past research also suggests that some police may not may view it as a soft option. So, for example, uh, here's a quote from a police officer in New South Wales Audit Office report, which suggests that cautioning is about effective ascension is getting hit on the head with a wet lettuce. Um, so, it's definitely plausible that the differences in um, uh, the rates at which Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal offenders receive cannabis cautions is because of what who police deem worthy uh, to, of receiving a caution. Uh, unfortunately, the analysis in the Guardian article doesn't go any further than presenting the raw rates. So it's very difficult to ascertain from this whether discrimination is a key driver of the gap. Um, so our study really aims to disentangle uh, what possible reasons might exist for the disparity in cannabis cautioning. So we thought about a few reasons why there might be a disparity. So, um, and we came up with four that, and that's kind of the framework of our study. First, maybe Aboriginal people are less likely to be eligible for the cannabis cautioning scheme. Second, their characteristics may be different in a way that reduces their likelihood of, of being considered by police as worthy of a caution. Um, they could also be dealt with in police areas where police are more uh, harsh and take, are more severe towards uh, use possessed cannabis offenses and prefer to charge them instead or formally proceed against them instead. Uh, and then the last possible explanation is discrimination or bias. So uh, the data on our study is all uh, 38,813 events 
uh, where uh, used ca possess cannabis offense was uh, detected between 2017 and 2020, so it's, it's more recent, uh, basically from the end of that Guardian article up to uh, 2020. And of this, we have 8,000 observ observations or events involving Aboriginal people and about 30,000 involving non-Aboriginal adults. For these uh, observations, we have information on their demographics, so um, age, gender, Aboriginality, socioeconomic uh, status of their postcode of residence. We have information on any other offenses that they might have in the same event. We have their criminal history, uh, including the number and the types of their prior contacts. And we have the police error command uh, in which they were dealt with. So in our sample, like that in the Guardian article, we f also find a considerable gap in cannabis cautioning between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. Uh, Non-Aboriginal people are cautioned 44% of the time uh, versus only 12% of the time for Aboriginal adults uh, caught in possession of cannabis. So this translates to a 32 percentage point dis uh, raw disparity in cautioning rates. Uh, if you're wondering why I chose such a funny visualization for this slide, hopefully all will become clear. <laughs> Um, so the first of our four candidate explanations that I'll go through is the possibility that Aboriginal people are less likely to be eligible for caution. Um, there are seven eligibility criteria for cannabis cautioning in New South Wales. So the offender needs to be an adult. They need to have no prior drug, violent, or sexual offenses. They sh uh, have not committed any other concurrent offenses that result in illegal action on the same event. Um, and they must not have uh, more than two prior cannabis cautions. Um, but three of these, the remaining three, we actually can observe in our data. They need to have less than 15 grams of cannabis. They need to admit to the offense and consent to being cautioned. And their identity needs to be confirmed. So our concept of eligibility is a little bit flawed because it's uh, restricted to those four criteria that we can actually observe in the data. Uh, this could be important uh, in some respects, potentially if Aboriginal people, for example, are less likely to, to admit to the offense, or, um, for example. So. Uh, and in addition to this, police can also exercise their discretion in choosing whether to caution or not caution an eligible offender. So what do we find in terms of eligibility? Aboriginal adults are much less likely to be eligible for cannabis caution than, than non-Aboriginal adults. Uh, so on the top bar there, you can see that of the 30,000 non-Aboriginal um, offenders and uh, events involving, non that. I'll just say offenders, it's easier. Um, in our sample, about 54% were eligible whereas the comparable number is 22% for the Aboriginal people, which means that out of the 8,000 events that we observe for Aboriginal people, uh, in over 6,000 of the, those events, the person was ineligible for the cannabis caution in the first place. So eligibility is a key driver of um, this gap in uh, cannabis cautioning. So I guess the next question is why are they uh, ineligible? So this chart examines just the proportions of people in each group who are meeting each eligibility criteria. So it's not cumulative, it's, it's one by one. Um, as we can see, the first thing to note is that very few people are, are running up against the limit of prior cannabis cautions uh, in both groups. It's four, four, only 4% uh, of non-Aboriginal people and 2% of Aboriginal people are being excluded on this basis. Um, uh, turning to no, having no concurrent offenses, here we see a bit more of a gap. So uh, three quarters of non-Aboriginal people caught in uh, possession of cannabis do not have any concurrent offenses on the same event uh, versus only 63% for Aboriginal people. But the major driver of the gap in eligibility, at least, is in terms of prior drug, violent, and sexual offenses. Aboriginal people are about half, um, the, well, the proportion of Aboriginal people meeting this eligibility criteria is about half of the non-Aboriginal people. So, this leads us to ask what types of offenses are excluding Aboriginal people from being eligible for this scheme. So, okay, here we go, sorry. Um, so, here's a chart showing, again, the proportion of people who had uh, each type of offense uh, in the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal groups. Really, four offense types appear to be most responsible for uh, driving the ineligibility of Aboriginal people. Uh, the first thing to note is that used possessed drugs is one of these. Um, there's a big gap. The Aboriginal people are nearly twice as likely to have a prior used possessed offence. We haven't examined it in great detail in this study, but it's definitely possible that some Aboriginal people are being excluded from cannabis cautioning because they were not previously cautioned. Um, other things to note 
Um, some of these offenses, the gaps in these offenses are pretty serious. For example, serious assault res resulting in injury. Um, and, but also concerning is stalking. Uh, Aboriginal people are 10 percentage points more likely to have a stalking offense. Um, we've done some work at Boxar showing that police have increased uh, a folk, well, they've started policing these offenses more and it's disproportionately affecting Aboriginal people. So that's definitely something to uh, be concerned about. So now we've established that eligibility is in fact driving some of the, the differences in cannabis cautioning rates. So our next question is, are there further differences uh, even when police consider only those uh, offenders who are el eligible? So the short answer is yes. The chart shows that this chart is showing the flow of the eligible offenders into being cautioned. The blue percentages and uh, the percentages in the blue bubbles are the percent of eligible offenders who are cautioned in each group. So even among the eligible offenders, we still find a 34 percentage point disparity in the likelihood of a cannabis caution. So 74 percent of non-Aboriginal uh, offenders are being cautioned versus only 40 percent of the non-Aboriginal uh, offenders. So let's uh, go into some of the reasons. Oh, yes. So here's the rest. And now I'm showing in the green bubbles the overall raw rates of, dispar uh, of cannabis cautioning, which I showed you earlier. So I guess now that we know that even among those who are eligible, there are still gaps in cannabis cautioning, the question is why? Um, is it because the cohorts differ in ways that make police less or more likely to issue cautions? Uh, are Aboriginal people disproportionately being dealt with in police areas that are more severe towards cannabis? Or is there some sort of unexplained bias that's present? Noting at this point that because we can't observe some of that eligibility criteria, our ability to, to actually attribute any unexplained difference to this will be minimal. So, um, Eligible Aboriginal offenders are different to uh, eligible non-Aboriginal offenders. I know these summary statistics slides can be a bit um, tedious, but long story short, our groups, our cohorts do differ in some respects. Uh, the Aboriginal group tends to be uh, 12 percentage points more likely to be female, uh, 10 percentage points more likely to be aged between 35 and 54. They are more likely to reside in regional areas and also reside in areas that are in the lowest two socioeconomic quotas. Uh, but what's really stark is the differences in the criminal history. Um, the Aboriginal offenders in our sample are 43 percentage points more likely to have a prior court uh, appearance. They're 16 percentage points more likely to have had a previous prison sentence. Um, and uh, they're also more likely to have a host of different types of offenses. So. We also find that even just looking descriptively that police areas do vary in their use of cannabis cautioning. So most of the police area commands are uh, issue cannabis cautions about 60% of the time, but some of them are more lenient uh, where they might caution up to 85% of the offenders um, and others are more strict and caution about 35% of all eligible offenders. However, you know, these simple rates don't account for differences in the characteristics of the offenders that are appearing in each of those police areas. So really to address this question, we need to be able to disentangle the, contr the contribution of offender characteristics, police area, and um, from other unobserved differences. And that leads me to the method that we use. Um, we use a method called the Kitagawa Oaxaca Blinder Decomposition. Um, again, I'm not going to go into too much technical detail. I love the laugh. People love the, laugh. People love the name of this. Um, so how it works is that um, it estimates a model using all the variables that we have and predicts cannabis, the likelihood of receiving cannabis cautioning for the Aboriginal group and another model for the non-Aboriginal group. I won't go through the math, mainly because I don't have a whiteboard, but I, I love it. And, uh, but if you rearrange the terms from these two models, you actually can split the variation into two sources. So the first considers what the cautioning rate would be if the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal groups were the same. So, um, you know, if we, if all, on all those characteristics I talked about earlier, demographics, criminal history, the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal cohorts were the same, what would their um, can cannabis questioning rates would be? And this is what we call the explained component. The unexplained component is, is estimated by thinking about if we treated our Aboriginal cohort like we do the non-Aboriginal cohort, what would the cannabis questioning rate be? And taking that, that difference. So, Basically, it's saying if offenders had the same characteristics and we just applied a different model, what, what would we get? So that's how it decomposes the two, uh, the variation. 
So, um, wait, I forgot to say one thing. Um, and you might be wondering, why go through all this rigmarole um, when most studies, similar studies, just use one regression model and tell you what the magic number is on the aboriginality variable? Well, the advantage of this method is we can actually look at uh, the math goes even further, and you can actually decompose it down to the individual variable. So this allows us to at least apportion the association between a particular variable and the gap, um, and so it kind of affords us a, a broader range of information. It's also possible to do this within one regression model, but it gets a bit crazy. So this is much simpler. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's a 34 0.4 percentage point disparity in cautioning rates uh, for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal offenders who are eligible for a caution. Um, of the variables that we have available to us, 31.5 uh, percentage points, or 92% of the disparity, can be explained by variables in our data. So the, the variable that explains the most of this uh, is prior court appearances. Um, that is 59% of that gap. So a long story short is that basically 59% of that disparity in cannabis questioning is coming because of the differences in the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal groups in their prior court appearances. Um, additional variables that were also contributing to the gap, four percentage points uh, in terms of various different types of prior offenses. We've rolled them up into one here for simplicity. Um, the police uh, error command fixed effects were still uh, important. They were 14%. And um, of five percentage points, all 14% of the gap. Uh, prior prison and demographics explain a little bit more, and time explained very little. So uh, in s that leaves us with a 2.9 percentage point unexplained difference uh, in cannabis cautioning rates. So it could be a signal of discrimination, but as I said, because our study is a bit flawed and that we can't observe some of those um, variables that affect cannabis cautioning, it could also be a product of these unobserved variables. So uh, I'll sum up now. I've, I've already been warned, so uh, I'll, I'll go through some of the things we find. So long story short, eligibility is one of the major drivers of the gap in cannabis cautioning. Uh, nearly eight in 10 of uh, times that an Aboriginal person is caught in possession of cannabis, they are already excluded from the cannabis cautioning scheme. Uh, mostly due to having prior drug and violent offenses. Uh, so the second thing we find is that police are applying discretion not to caution some offenders, particularly uh, it appears to be correlated with their prior criminal histories, but we can't say for sure. Um, and a too small 2.9 percentage point gap still remains, which cannot be explained by the factors available to us. Uh, it's really important to note some of the limitations of our study. Unlike Ilya's study, we were not able to get at a causal estimate, so our study is associative, um, and there are missing variables which are potentially important, like the likelihood of admitting um, to a cannabis, uh, likelihood to admitting to the offense. Um, and as Ilya said, we, we really can't account for the prior differences um, or prior bias that might be driving the accumulation of priors uh, in both the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal groups. Um, so it's, if there ha you know, any over-policing that's already occurred um, that, that has affected the number of prior contacts that Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people have at the point that they're detected with cannabis, our model t is totally agnostic to this and not able to really um, account for it at all. And, and so this is particularly concerning because there are other types of research, uh, including one using this method, um, for example, showing that there is a significant unexplained gap in, in youth diversion, for example. So our results would be, would be kind of um, susceptible to this. Uh, I guess the next question is how we could possibly work towards closing the gap. Uh, I think on the, the surface, certainly relaxing the eligibility criteria would be one avenue that, that could be taken to uh, increase the likelihood of Aboriginal offenders getting a cannabis caution. Certainly at face value, looking at the results, you might be thinking that, oh, if we just relax the eligibility criteria, we've got a huge jump in cautioning. It's important to remember that the police can still apply their discre discretion. So some of those newly uh, eligible people would still uh, likely not get a caution because of the factors that police consider in cautioning. So that's another potential policy uh, change that the police might want to think about is whether they can reduce scope for discretion. Um, in other jurisdictions, there are similar types of drug diversion programs, for example, in South Australia and Victoria, where all eligible offenders are cautioned. 
Um, so there, there's precedent for that. And perhaps even a combination of the two might be uh, extremely effective. But ultimately, um, you know, I think this study, well, reinforces and adds to everything we know that we have a lot of work to do in reducing the how Aboriginal people are accumulating so much contact with the criminal justice system. Um, you know, I, again, can't do this as much justice as Brendan and others from today, but um, yeah, this is really one of the other things that um, just wanted to reinforce that we need to keep working towards. So thank you very much. for some questions. Okay. Thanks very much for that, Sarah. Um, great presentation. You sh showed a slide um, with differences in PACs or LACs, I think, in terms of um, how often or the percentage of cautions that were given out. Was there any... It would, did that differ from regional and metropolitan areas, or was it uh, random? Well, yeah, I mean, um, Eastern Suburbs Pack was quite different, I've got to say. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, the, um, yeah, I think there was, as I recall. There were, but I think it's, um, it's certainly, yeah, probably... It's hard to infer a lot from these, because, like I said earlier, it's the, it's the characteristics, right? Like, they're not... Um, what we really need to do to actually get at a better um, answer about how uh, how the PACs are treating cannabis cautioning offenders is to put it into a type of model that will allow us to put in the characteristics and then extract the le the, the PAC uh, cautioning rates. So we haven't done that, but we could do that. I think it would be interesting. Um, yeah. Oh, hi, thank you for the um, presentation, it's really great. Uh, just a quick question about the um, differences between the raw disparity versus the explained disparity. Is it this one? Yeah, that, that 2.9 percentage point difference. Mm -hmm. is, that t is that statistically uh, significant? Uh, it is not statistically significant um, from what I can see. I don't, I don't think it is. Um, so no, it's not, but yeah, it's there, I guess. Sure, thanks, thank you. Um, no, on that, I, I probably should say, I think, you know, in the past, sometimes people have criticized us for downplaying the, the that differences are in percentage points. So uh, it's important to remember that when you convert it by the volume, there's still some people out there who potentially could be getting a caution who are not. And even though that's a small number, it's not, um, you know, it's not insignificant to their lives. Um. Uh, I think, I'm not sure if the audience are aware, but on this slide, so these um, characteristics that we're saying are explained are actually all outside the parameters of the eligibility criteria. Yeah. So I don't know if you want to just pick that point up a bit. Yeah, Sarah. okay. Thank you, Jackie. Um, um, yeah, exactly. So we've for, these are all people who are already eligible for the scheme, so they don't have any of those prior drug, violent, or sexual offences. So what this means is that the police are considering let's what we've been calling unrelated priors in their decision to caution, at least or at least factors that correlate with it, right? So I think this is where, why. I mean, the cannabis cautioning scheme is not like a legislative scheme, so there's no actual legislation that governs it. It's a police program. So uh, in a way, there are no sort of public guidelines on what, what police should consider. So um, there's a few issues there. There's certainly a scope for, for changing and thinking about whether it's whether some of these priors are actually relevant in, in considering whether to issue a caution. Um, 
Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Um, and that brings this session to a close. Thanks, everyone.